I would like to begin by just warning some folks that this morning deals with some very difficult subjects, loss, and if you feel the need to turn off your video and grab some tissues, or if you just find it too difficult, will understand if you need to leave the room this morning, because living with loss is difficult. The choir, the soloists sing, they are trying to do the unimaginable. They're trying to live <clears throat> with a shattered trust between Alexander and Eliza because of the revelation of the affair between Maria Reynolds and Alexander. They're trying to do the unimaginable, live with the humiliation to the family with the publication of the Reynolds pamphlet and the gossip and the ridicule that followed Hamilton's publication of that pamphlet. And worst of all, they're trying to deal with the death of their oldest son, Philip, in a duel. When Philip wanted to defend his father's honor and name as a result of that public humiliation. The family has experienced life-shattering events, heartbreaking losses. The most difficult thing a parent can do is to bury their child. Angelica sings the summation of the circumstances. There are moments that the words don't reach there is suffering too terrible to name. The moments, some of those moments, when you're in so deep, it feels easier to just swim down. My dear friends, these are not unknown circumstances for some of us in our own congregation. The sudden loss of a childhood friend, a son and brother, a sister to a drug overdose. A dear friend is lost to a motorcycle or a motor vehicle accident. Or a parent is lost to a sudden heart attack. The shattering of marriage on the discovery of an affair by a spouse. The diagnosis of a terminal debilitating illness for a husband, child, or a dear friend. Moments that words don't reach. In fact, when those words occur, we don't want to hear anything, and certainly not the well-intentioned platitudes that are often offered up at times like this. Moments when you're so deep in grief, the pain is so sharp, you just want to swim down to escape from this world of grief and pain. And possibly some even think to join the loved one that they've lost. Let's also consider the grief of the families of those that have lost loved ones to COVID unable to be with them in their final moments, dying, holding the hand of a medical professional that is a complete stranger to them. The sudden destruction of a home or business, as the residents in Iowa and Illinois found out last week, and the derecho that blew through their area wreaking havoc. The wildfires that are raging in California as a result of both extreme heat, little precipitation, 
and lightning strikes. And let's be honest, it's not a sudden loss, but the discussion of the potential sale of our church building and the prospect of having to consider the closing of the congregation, they are moments of genuine loss and grief also. How do we learn to live beyond our losses when the unimaginable is thrust into our lives, severing close, familiar, loving, comfortable connections? The prophet Jeremiah writes that he is one who has seen affliction and he lists in the book of Lamentations all of the trials that he has gone through and the problems that he is currently experiencing. Though I call for help and I cry to God, God shuts out my prayer. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. If you see him in the street, walking by himself, talking to himself, have pity. Alexander's hair has gone gray. He walks the length of the city every day, turning over and over in his mind and heart the events, the unimaginable events. What can he do? How does he move forward with Eliza? How does he keep his family whole? Angelica sings, there are moments that the words don't reach. There is a grace too powerful to name. Grace. In Jeremiah's recitation of his woes, he comes to a point where he says, my soul continually thinks of all these problems and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. It is new. God's mercies are new every morning. Great is God's faithfulness. With all that is going wrong now, Jeremiah says, I remember in the past, God was faithful, compassionate, loving. In today's reading from Psalm 103, the psalmist sings the same song as Jeremiah. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, Bless God's holy name. In dark moments of deep despair, that is when it is so vital that we have an ongoing active relationship with God, with the divine to fall back on. A relationship with God is not a switch we can turn on and off when we need it. God is not a vending machine that when we enter the right prayer, our grief gets taken away or our problems are instantly solved. Psalm 23 promises that we still have to walk through the valley of the shadow. Or as some would say, the only way to get to it is to go through it. But in that valley, Along that dark journey, Psalm 103 reminds us, do not forget all God's benefits. What are those benefits? God forgives all our iniquity. God heals our diseases. God redeems our lives from the pit. God crowns us with steadfast love and mercy. And there, my friends, is the theme of this psalm. Steadfast love and mercy from God. 
God satisfies us with good so that our youth is renewed like the eagles. Not literally. God is not meant to be our fountain in youth, but God restores our spirit when we put our faith and our trust in God. In those first five verses, the psalmist sings as an individual, reminding the self of what God has done for the self. But then as the psalm continues, the psalmist widens the expression of what God is and who God is dealing with. There, the psalmist is talking about God's impact on the whole community. And again, has said the steadfast love of God. What does God do for the community? What, God, what does God do for the body of Christ? God works vindication and justice for all who are oppressed. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. That is a quotation from Exodus 34, the exodus from Egypt and the incident with the golden calf in the wilderness where God is angry and Moses reminds God that these are God's covenant people. You are merciful and gracious. God will not always accuse God will not keep his anger forever. And the final reminder the psalmist tells us, God doesn't deal with us based on what we do wrong, our sins, and uh, doesn't repay us because God is merciful and gracious. Forgiveness is granted to us. This list of dealings of God with the community comes with the reminder of God's proclamation to Moses. After the people have done the unthinkable sin, as God is bringing them to a promised land, they have forgotten God, and they've made another God. Still, God forgives. God carries them on. And this formula, that God forgives iniquity, sins, and transgressions, is one of the most important theological statements about God in the scriptures. That is what God does for us. God's steadfast love, chesed, is about God's character and about God's actions. And here in Psalm 103, that steadfast love is paired with compassion. In other places, it's paired with faithfulness. But here in this psalm, it's compassion. In spite of all that we do, in spite of all that we may become, God can forgive and God has compassion on us. Compassion is an attitude and a conduct of one who restrains their anger and acts in a kindly manner. And isn't that what we're describing God as here? Compassion, when, com when paired here with steadfast love, emphasizes that God is most inclined toward forgiveness. God always comes back, no matter in the arc of scripture where it happens when someone sins against God. God always comes back with an offer of forgiveness and a renewal of God's covenant. And the verses that follow remind us of that. Because the psalmist continues to sing, For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great 
is that steadfast love towards those who show reverence to God. As far as the east is from the west, so far God removes our transgressions from us. As a father, as a parent, has compassion on their child and their children, so God has compassion on us when we reverence God, when we have a relationship with God. For God knows how we are made, and God remembers that we are dust. That reminder to us, steadfast love, compassion are part of God's covenant. They come together. It is a reminder that here is good news. There is a gospel message here. And when that gospel message is paired with our reverence toward God, our fear, as the King James Version would call it, we are putting both gospel and law together. Gospel and law Fear, reverence, steadfast love, compassion, they are all essential to a life of faith. So that as we look at the losses in our life, we can look to God for help. Will we get instant answers? Not always. There will be that valley of the shadow all of us will from time to time have to walk through. But it is that promise that God is always with us, that God makes that walk with us and holds us close when we choose to be close with God as well. And that is a choice. That is something we can do. And that is the whole point of public worship. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless God's holy name to give thanks for that steadfast love, to give thanks for the compassion, to give thanks for the forgiveness that we are given. And as we gather in worship, God asks us to remain close to God throughout our daily walk and our life. Alexander acknowledges that he has not always walked close with God. He takes the children to the work to church on Sunday, does the sign of the cross at the door. And it's almost with a sense of amazement in the music. And I pray that never used to happen before. The difficult circumstances in our life draw us close to God. May God keep us close to God as we go through those tough circumstances. The poet and pastor Jan Richardson was no stranger to loss. She lost her husband suddenly in December 2013. And after she came through her valley of the shadow, she wrote a book called The Cure for Sorrow, a prayer, a book of blessings for times of grief. And this blessing struck me this week. Welcoming blessing. When you are lost in your own life, when the landscape you have known falls away, when your familiar path becomes foreign and you find yourself a stranger in the story you had held most dear, then let yourself be lost. Let yourself leave for a place whose contours 
you do not already know, whose cadences you have not learned by heart. Let yourself land on a threshold that mirrors the mystery of your own bewildered soul. It will come as a surprise. What arrives to welcome you through the door? Making a place for you at the table and calling you by your name. Let what comes come. Let the glass be filled. Let the light be tended. Let the hands lay before you what you will, what will meet you in your hunger. Let the laughter, let the sweetness that enters the sorrow, let the solace that comes as sustenance and sudden unbidden grace. For what comes offer gladness. For what greet you with kindly welcome, offer thanks. Offer blessing for those who gathered you in and will not be forgotten. Those who, when you were a stranger, made a place for you at the table and called you by name. What struck me is when Jan wrote of a solace that comes as sustenance and sudden unbidden grace. Angelica sang of a grace too powerful to name. And the psalmist sings, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Grace, unmerited, love, unconditional, ever faithful, ever sure, that is our God. In spite of all that we may do, in spite of all who we are, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Beloved friends, never forget that. As our final hymn reads this morning in verse 2, God of the past, our times are in your hand. With us abide. Lead us by faith to hope's true promised land. Be now our guide. Bless us in times of darkness and of light. Then faith's fair vision changes into sight. May God add God's blessing. Amen.